poetry and nature, two great forces that can help us to recover a sense of wonder and deepen our relationship with God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Hi, my name is Ed Horstman and welcome to the online service of worship from Round Hill Community Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. We are delighted that you have joined us for this online experience of worship and we look forward to staying connected with you in this way. And happy Earth Day Sunday. For this online service of worship, we'll be celebrating the church's calling to be fantastic stewards of creation care. So we'll be using poetry and music and prayers to help us deepen our commitment to the well-being of the earth and to deepen our communion with God. If you happen to be in the area on Sunday, April the 21st, we hope you'll join us at Round Hill Community Church. We will be welcoming a marvelous organization called Sky Hunters in Flight. They feature a series of raptors, amazing birds, and they will be doing demonstrations with the congregation following our service of worship. I also hope that you'll visit our church website, roundhillcommunitychurch.org. There you will find all the latest information about programs and opportunities to grow in friendship with one another and to deepen our sense of connection with God. Together with people of faith and hope and love, let us center our lives where true joy may be found. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Creating God in you, everything on earth and in the heavens is bound together in perfect harmony. Open our eyes to behold your creation. Create in us a new spirit of awareness of our place in your delicate balance. Transform our hearts that we may reclaim our sense of awe and wonder. Quicken our understanding that we may acknowledge our responsibility and strengthen our resolve to work with you for the healing of your creation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And let us pray together in the words that Jesus used when he taught his disciples how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Muriel Rukeyser was an American poet. She was born in New York City in 1913. Over the course of five decades, she created 15 different collections of poetry. She was an activist, and much of her poetry involves ruminations and meditations on the major events of her time. She once wrote this about poetry. If there were no poetry on any day in the world, Poetry would be invented that day, for there would be an intolerable hunger for it. So I am bringing poetry to the forefront on Earth Day Sunday. And my hope 
is that these poems would not only help us to reflect more deeply about the world of nature around us, maybe hearing these poems will even have the effect of wanting us to get outside, to listen and to look and to receive the messages of nature that are in fact coming to us all the time. So I want to begin with a biblical poem. We might not think about this particular reading as a poem, but it is. It's the 23rd Psalm. It is probably the best known of all of the 150 Psalms that we have in our Old Testament. A reading from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to make one observation about the 23rd Psalm, which has been such a source of comfort for people of faith for over 2,500 years. Part of what interests me about the 23rd Psalm is that in one sense, it's a, it's a psalm that calls us into an experience of rest. It describes how deeply God wants us to be nourished by rest, and that God, in fact, makes us to lie down in green pastures. So there is in this poem um, the, the revealing of God as one who wants to care for us at the deepest levels of our being. On the other hand, there's also the understanding that in many seasons of life, we move through great challenges, sometimes times of threat. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And so this is the other side of the 23rd Psalm, not only words that call us to a deep experience of replenishment, but words that also promise accompaniment when we are walking through those challenging valleys. So as we think about the world of nature all around us, I think about the forces of nature in one sense as being able to call us into a, 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 an experience of being grounded on the earth and being centered, but also in the way in which we can be inspired by nature, lifted up by nature uh, as we navigate the various challenges of our lives. So I invite you to cherish the 23rd Psalm as an experience of, of language that calls us into a time of rest, but also promises a, the accompaniment of God when times are not so restful. And then this poem by William Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things. By the way, Wendell Berry is a Kentucky farmer poet and essayist who in his life has managed not only to work the land, but also to use language to help us to see more clearly the world around us. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free.
When I thought about which poems to include for our online service of worship for Earth Day Sunday, I had a bias. I wanted to choose poems that reflected a spirit of hope. After all, during the month of April, we've been considering the theme of hope as part of our year-long series on what matters most, hope as an essential quality of human life because it has the power to draw us into the future even when we cannot predict exactly what the future will be like. So in these poems, I was looking for that theme of hopefulness and confidence about the future. And one of the poems that came to mind is a creation by Gerard Manley Hopkins, a 19th century poet, God's Grandeur. I love this poem very much. It's not necessarily an easy poem to read or to hear because it has some of the language of the 19th century, but I think the meaning and the sense of what Gerard Manley Hopkins was trying to communicate can still be clear to us. One of the things that he managed to do in his poem was to take a very serious, clear-eyed look at the world in which he was living, a world that was beginning to be damaged by the Industrial Revolution. He saw that damage reflected in the countryside, the English countryside, and also in the lives of human beings who were being crushed in some ways by this revolution. So here's a poem of hopefulness, which contains a, a very clear view of the world that was changing, but nevertheless affirms a deep sense of confidence and hope about the future. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then, now, not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. As I said, some of the language in that poem is a little dated from our perspective, but what comes through for me in this poem, The Grandeur of God by Gerard Manley Hopkins, is this sense that despite all of the burden and the pressure that had been inflicted upon the earth by the Industrial Revolution, Hopkins was still hopeful about the future. He says there lives the dearest freshness, deep down things because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. His belief in the Spirit of God moving through the earth, moving amongst people, calling us to a greater consciousness, calling us to better stewardship of our world. It's a beautiful poem, and from my perspective, it's filled with hope. And so I offer an echo to that poem, this one by a Welsh poet, R.S. Thomas, who lived from 1913 to the year 2000, and it is simply called The Other. There are nights that are so still that I can hear the small owl calling far off and a fox barking miles away. It is then that I lie in the lean hours awake, listening to the swell born somewhere in the Atlantic, rising and falling, rising and falling, wave on wave on the long shore by the village that is without light and companionless. And the thought comes of that other being who is awake to letting our prayers break on him, 
Not like this for a few hours, but for days, years, for eternity. I suppose if I have a most favorite nature poem, it's this one, The First of May by Ann Porter, because it celebrates peepers. Now, how many poems celebrate peepers? Every year in the spring, I wait for their sound. And if I'm driving around in the evening around Greenwich, early March, I'll always roll down the window of my car to see if I can hear them out there in the marshy areas beginning to chant their familiar chant. So I love this poem by Ann Porter because it celebrates not only these wonderful little creatures and how powerful they can be, but also this sense of vitality in the world of nature all the time that's calling to us, calling us to awaken our own inner sense of vitality and offer our own unique songs and sayings and wisdom to the world. So the first of May by Ann Porter. Now the smallest creatures who do not know they have names in fields of pure sunshine open themselves and sing all over the marshes and in the wet meadows, wherever there's water, the companies of peepers who cannot count their members gather with sweet shouting and the flowers of the woods who cannot see each other appear in perfect likeness of one another among the weak new shadows on the mossy places. Now the smallest creatures who know themselves by heart with all their tender might and roundness of delight spending their colors, their myriads and their voices, praise the moist ground and every winking leaf and the new sun that smells of the new streams. All right, that's my most favorite nature poem, I admit it, I confess. But I am also very fond of this poem by Barbara Crooker, which is called, sometimes, I am startled out of myself. And I included it as one of the poems for this online service of worship because I think some of our best and most beautiful interactions with nature are the ones that take place in a condition of being startled. When we hear a bird song we haven't heard before, or when the sun plays out on a field in just a particular way, or when we notice a fox jogging across the backyard and we're startled, but in ways that don't frighten us, but which give us a sense of hopefulness about the future. That's the best way of being startled. So here's a poem by Barbara Crooker. Sometimes I'm startled out of myself, like this morning, when the wild geese came squawking flapping their rusty hinges, and something about their trek across the sky made me think about my life. The places of brokenness, the places of sorrow, the places where grief has strung me out to dry. And then the geese come calling, the leader falling back when tired, another taking her place. Hope is born on wings. Look at the trees. They turn to gold for a brief while, then lose it all each November. Through the cold months, they stand, take the worst weather has to offer, and still they put out shy green leaves come April, come May. The geese glide over the cornfields, land on the pond with its sedges and reeds. You do not have to be wise. Even a goose knows how to find shelter where the corn lie, still lies in the stubble and dried stalks. 
All we do is pass through here the best way we can. They stitch up the sky and it is whole again. Amen. We've done things a little differently for this online service of worship, and I want to carry that thread into our experience of prayer. For our pastoral prayer, I'm going to lift up a series of statements on the theme of hope that were created by the missionary sisters of St. Charles Borromeo, living in Honduras. And this series of statements is contained in a book called God's Good Earth, Praise and Prayer for Creation by Anne and Jeffrey Rothorn. It's a beautiful collection of resources for creation care, and we'll continue to draw from this resource in weeks to come, but I want especially for us to use this series of statements as the basis for our pastoral prayer. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your constant accompaniment of us. And help us in that spirit of companionship to offer ourselves to the world around us, to befriend one another, to offer hospitality to the stranger, to reach out to the world with love and compassion. Hear our prayers for all those people across the world who seek greater life and health and well being who may be living in the shadow of violence, who are struggling in their search for better health, and help us in whatever way possible and in concert with communities of faith across the world to be ambassadors of your hope. For to have hope is to believe that history continues to be open to your dream and to the vitality of human creativity. To have hope is to continue affirming that it is possible to dream a different world without hunger, without injustice, without discrimination. To have hope, O oh God, is to be one of your messengers and one of your ambassadors. To have hope is to believe in the revolutionary potential of faith. To have hope is to leave the door open so that the Spirit can enter and make all things new. To have hope is to believe that life wins over death. To have hope is to begin again as many times as necessary. To have hope is to live. And let us pray together in the words of the Round Hill Community Church Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, shed forth thy blessed spirit upon all our lives. Make each one of us an instrument in thy hands for good Purify our hearts, strengthen our minds and bodies, fill us with Christian love. Let no pride, no self-conceit, no rivalry, no ill will ever spring up among us. Make us earnest and true, wise and prudent, giving no just cause for offense. And may thy holy peace rest upon us this day and every day throughout the coming week, sweetening our trials, cheering us in our work, and keeping us faithful to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Go forth in peace as people of hope. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and always. And may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen.
As you carry the spirit of this worship experience with you, there are a few things that you can do that would make a big difference to us. Like the video, subscribe if you aren't, and click the notification bell and select all. Thank you.